When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends, and welcome back. I'm Jared Halverson. This is Unshaken. And as always, we've got some amazing scripture to discuss this week. Though some might not believe me with that, since we are into several books of scripture that might be among the least well-known in the entire Old Testament, which is tragic. I mean, people don't seem to understand Isaiah, but at least they know him and know they should be studying him. But the prophets we'll discuss today are so easily overlooked and underappreciated which is tragic because honestly, out of today's material, there will, we'll see a verse, for example, that Paul quotes to the Jews and Jesus quotes to the Nephites. It's that important. We'll see a verse today that in some ways was the, the spark that ignited the Protestant Reformation. How's that for impact? Uh, the books today are incredibly applicable, even though they so often go overlooked. And here they are buried in the back <laughs> that we are halfway through the book of the 12, We've got six minor prophets behind us and now six yet ahead. And we're so close to the New Testament, maybe by now we're getting trunky and just want to move forward. But endure to the end. It's worth it. We are at the 3 to one countdown before the blast off into the New Testament in the new year. And literally, we'll have three prophets today and two next week and then one, just Malachi, for our final lesson. Uh, but the three that we'll be studying today are Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. And perhaps they go forgotten because we don't know much about them at all. Even among minor prophets, at least Hosea, we knew his family dynamics and the strange names of his children. And at least with Amos, we knew him well enough to know that he was a, a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. We saw the story that we all know in the book of Jonah last week. But when it comes to these three... Basically, all we know about them is that they were prophets. But maybe that's enough because their messages are so prophetic, not only for their day, but for our own. Now, if I could sum up the three together, I would say that they, these three prophets provide for us a chronological crescendo of consequences. Is that enough alliteration for you? <laughs> we are going to see words of woe and warnings of coming destruction in each of these books. And each one will, again, get a little more intense and a little closer to home for us. The book of Nahum is written to the Ninevites. That's how I remember it. N for Nahum and N for Nineveh. Okay, a little mnemonic device for you. And, what, and Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Yes, those Assyrians that are coming down to conquer the northern kingdom. Get this close to conquering the southern kingdom. Scatter the tribes. Uh, that's what's happening in the days of Isaiah, okay? And so Nahum most likely was living around the same time period, perhaps a little bit, a little earlier. But his message is one of, it's not about the Ninevites, it's to the Ninevites. And he's warning them, you're about to be destroyed. Does that sound familiar, by the way, as of last week? Isn't that what Jonah's message was? But in Jonah's case, they listened and they repented and they were spared. In Nahum's case, no such luck. They will not repent, and they will be destroyed by the Babylonians. And that's when Habakkuk comes onto the scene. Because Habakkuk also has a message of destruction. At first, it's a message to Judah saying, you're going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. But then it shifts, and now the message is to the Babylonians, you're going to be destroyed too. In their case, by the Persians. You see how it, it's, we've used this analogy before of like the little fish getting eaten by the bigger fish behind it and then eaten by the still bigger fish behind it. And you have these dominoes of empires falling where the Assyrians fall to the Babylonians who fall to the Persians who fall to the Greeks who eventually fall to the Romans. And in each of these instances, each round is in some ways a, a prelude and preview of the kind of destruction that the wicked world will face before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that's where the book of Zephaniah comes in. 
that's the climax of the crescendo. And Zephaniah zooms out, sees big picture, and talks about the destruction of the world, the end times. And even if you remember the Isaiah chapters in 2 Nephi, so much history there, but one of the reasons that Nephi was bringing it up and that Isaiah was prophesying of all these things is that the destruction of the Assyrians was meant to help us understand what the destruction of the wicked at the end of the world would be like. And in case you missed the first time, look at it again. The destruction of the Babylonians will similarly be a preview of coming destructions at the end of time. In a way, what Isaiah did single-handedly, <laughs> these three prophets, yeah, I guess it takes three prophets to equal one Isaiah, right? But in a way, you have Nahum speaking of Assyria, you have Habakkuk speaking of Babylon, and then you have Zephaniah speaking of the end of the world. So Nahum and Habakkuk are pointing ahead to what Zephaniah is giving us. I hope that makes at least a little bit of sense. And as far as our own application is concerned, I hope these books, in some ways their messages are downers because it's destruction they're speaking of. But it's the destruction of the enemies of Israel. And that ought to give Israel hope. Knowing that someday our enemies will be all behind us. And the Lord will have come and conquered. And that we're in a millennial day of rest and peace. And it's all good. Finally. I do hope that we'll find hope in these messages today. Because yes, we have to pass through Armageddon. But as Elder Maxwell has said, that's just a step in the direction of Adam on Diamond. And that's really where we want to head. So let's allow these prophets to, to point us in that divine direction. We'll start with Nahum. Now his name comes from a Hebrew word meaning comfort. So his name could be translated something like comforter or consoler. It might actually be the shortened version of the name Nehemiah. Nahum, Nehemiah, the Yah at the end stands for Jehovah. So Nehemiah, the name means Jehovah has comforted. And in Nehemiah's case, that was, he personified it beautifully because he's the one that gets to help the Israelites come back and rebuild after the Babylonian destruction, right? Let's rebuild the city. Let's rebuild the temple. How's that for comfort and consolation? Well, Nahum's version of comfort is going to be different than Nehemiah's because, again, it's a matter of you can be comforted knowing that God is going to pass judgment upon your enemies and ultimately you will be free of them. So notice in Nahum, uh, Nahum chapter 1, verse 1, he begins this message and it's a warning to the foe, to the Assyrians. It begins, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. And as we saw back in the book of Isaiah, many a chapter began with that phrase, the burden of Edom, or the burden of Moab, or the burden of Babylon. And I love that description of the, the weight of responsibility that's on the shoulders of a prophet. It is a burden that they bear. I imagine the current first presidency in Quorum of the Twelve are probably all seven footers, or at least would be if they weren't so crushed by the weight of that heavy, heavy mantle. Yeah, those red chairs in, in the conference center, I think they only look comfortable. <laughs> I don't think they are. But like I, Ezekiel said, the watchman on the tower you better feel the weight of that responsibility because if you don't take it seriously, then, then the sins of the people will be on you. Well, the sins of the Assyrians, there's a lot to bear. Yeah, you think so? Nahum feels it. And so he bears this burden and tries to warn the Ninevites, the Assyrians, of their impending doom. Now he's gonna do it in a powerful way. Nahum is an incredible book of poetry. He's not quite as good as Isaiah. I mean, who could be? But it's, it's beautiful poetry throughout. And here at the beginning, he starts with an acrostic poem. Remember we saw a lot of acrostics in the book of Psalms, where an acrostic, you start with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and verse by verse, you work your way through the alphabet. This one's a partial acrostic. It'll only cover the first 15 letters. But the way he does it is with two rounds of seven stanzas. And in the middle of each stanza is just this reminder of something really important. Again, literarily, it's beautiful what Nahum does here. Uh, the first stanza, uh, or the first set of stanzas, excuse me, is going to talk about God's power over nature. But in the middle, and that's destructive power in many instances, but in the middle is a reminder of God's goodness. 
And then the second set, this other long uh, set of stanzas, is a, a, a description of God's power over the enemies of Israel, over his enemies. Again, a lot of power there, destructive power. And yet in the middle, another reminder of his goodness. So don't lose sight of the goodness of God in the midst of all of this destructive language. Okay, that's one of the messages of hope he's trying to hide here. So look at verse 2 and 3, and you'll be able to see both halves. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. Can you picture him kind of building off one phrase with the next? From revenge to revenge onto fury. He goes on, the Lord will take vengeance in his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Now, as strong as that sounds, notice the next verse. This gentle reminder, the Lord is slow to anger. But don't take that for granted because keep going and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. This is the God of the universe after all. So whirlwind and storm and cloud, yeah, that's nothing to him. <laughs> Let alone the Assyrian army which would be less than the dust of the earth. Now, to understand what, what Nahum is doing here, that, that, those two verses, two and three, really are fascinating. Because in some ways, it almost seems like Nahum is contradicting himself. Wait, you, you said he was slow to anger. Then why do you talk so much about fury and wrath and vengeance? What's up with that? Well, in some ways, those are all attributes of divinity, just on different sides of him. Sound like a proving of contraries? <laughs> I thought you'd, say, you'd think so. What Nahum is trying to do is help people understand that God is a God of perfect justice and a God of perfect mercy. In fact, he's a God of perfect judgment to know which of the two he needs to lead with in any given moment. It's one of the things I love about the lectures on faith. As Joseph Smith is describing the characteristics and attributes of God, there's a good long list, but three of them that really are relevant here is judgment, and justice and mercy. You see, it's the judgment that knows how to balance justice and mercy. As a parent, I stink at all three. And there's times I err on the side of justice and other times I err on the side of mercy, but I always seem to be erring on one side or the other. Will I ever get it right and know just how accountable to hold my children for their best you know, long-term results or just how merciful to give them another chance and know that they can do this? The Lord does it perfectly, and I think what Nahum is doing here in 2 and 3 is trying to balance things for his hearers. He's both of these. Uh, in, in a way, you see Alma doing this beautifully with his son Corianton, who has committed a major sin on his mission. And for four chapters, Alma 39, 40, 41, 42 is a long talk with Dad. That might have been uncomfortable. At least chapter 39 was. Because in 39, he goes strong on justice. It's more of that the Lord revengeth and he's furious and, and he reserves wrath. But just when you thought it was over for Corianton, Alma shifts gears and reminds him that God is also slow to anger. And he teaches him beautiful doctrines in chapter 40 and 41 and 42, including the balance of justice and mercy and the need for both. No wonder then at the very end, he nails this Goldilocks zone with Corianton. And he says this to him in Alma 42, 21. Now, my son, I desire that you should let these things trouble you no more. That's the slow to anger mercy side. But then, just in case Corianton is going to go back to his old ways, dad adds, and only let your sins trouble you with that trouble which shall bring you down unto repentance. That's when you know you're in the Goldilocks zone. You'll actually repent. You see, I can picture Corianton going, wait, don't, don't let these things trouble me? Then why'd you chew me, about, chew me out in 39? Well, because you weren't troubled enough. Okay, well, by the end, I was ultra troubled, way too troubled. So I know, that's why I'm pulling you back. Well, how troubled should I be? Great question, son. Just troubled enough to want to change. You see, if you're too troubled, you won't repent because you don't think you can. But if you're not troubled enough, then you won't repent because you don't think you must. And either way, you're not repenting, and that's a problem. So as Nahum is trying to get the Ninevites to repent, is he trying to balance justice and mercy for their sake as well? 
It sure seems like it. Now, notice also that the audience is the Ninevites themselves. So what he's saying about the God of Israel is meant for people who may not know him as well as they need. So let's go through that description one more time, okay? Start at the beginning of verse 2, God is jealous. Now, in our understanding, that's not a good thing. Uh, jealousy, isn't that kind of self-centered and they want everything that, for themselves that other people might have? Isn't that a human failing that's beneath God? Well, of course, which means it must mean something else when it says that God is jealous. Another way to take that might be that God is fiercely loyal to his people and demands that they be fiercely loyal to him. This is a covenant relationship after all, right? We're in a marriage together. Even when Gomer goes astray, Hosea stays faithful, but he's jealous. You are my wife. Come back, please. And not just for my sake, for yours. I'm the only one that can help you, the only one that can redeem you. And that's the jealousy of God. Stay with me here. I am are, am so intensely committed to my relationship with my covenant people. That's one thing you Ninevites need to know because you're treating my people like an enemy and, and I'm jealous of those people. I'm fiercely loyal to them. So if you're their enemy, then you're my enemy, which makes me your enemy too. So be careful here. And no wonder then he builds on that. The Lord revengeth. Oh yeah, he revenges and is furious. Oh yeah, he's vengeance on his adversaries, wrath for his enemies. Is that, am I referring to you now, Nineveh? Are you going to act like that? Become my enemy? Now in the middle of that is where he says the Lord is slow to anger. And then right back to great in power. And I'm not going to acquit the, wicked, acquit the wicked. And I think what he's getting at here is don't assume just because that promised vengeance and wrath hasn't come yet. Don't assume that it never will. Just because I am slow to anger doesn't mean I never get angry. Or better, yes, better said, righteous indignation. Oh, I feel it. But I restrain immediate justice in order to allow mercy to have some time to work. Now, this is key for all of us. Since in a way, just like we saw last week with Jonah, we are Nineveh. And the Lord needs to caution us at times through his prophets that, yes, God is slow to anger, but he is a just God. Do not underestimate that. And just because you haven't been punished for your sins yet, don't assume that you've been acquitted and that the piper will never come to be paid. No, the law of the harvest is a reality. It just doesn't always happen in this life. It will ultimately happen in the next but to understand where we need to be in all of this. I guess what I'm trying to say is, to borrow Paul's language, don't despise the riches of God's goodness. Don't presume upon his grace. I know he delighteth in mercy, as we saw last week with Micah. I know, yes, he is slow to anger, as we see this week in Nahum. But he is just and will always be. In a way, this whole sense of timing puts God in an interesting place. We see it in Joseph Smith Matthew that in the last days, the destruction of the wicked, that's what we're going to see in Zephaniah at the end of, today's, of this week's material. In that coming destruction, it will be so intense, the wickedness of the world, that if those days are not shortened, Jesus says, then no flesh shall be saved. That scares me to death. If we don't speed things up, if, if God doesn't hasten his work in his time, then nobody's going to make it. Wow. I mean, the world is getting worse, which means staying righteous appears to be getting more and more difficult. Well, will it get to a point where there's no chance for any of us to make it? Well, it would be that way if God did not intervene and speed things up. The analogy I always use, use with my students is in a, a basketball or a football game, if your team's ahead, but there's enough time on the clock for the other team to come back and beat you. And right now they have all the momentum on their side. And you're like, oh no. If we could end the game right now, we'd win because we're ahead. But if we let it go till the end, we're probably going to lose this thing. That's what Jesus is hinting at. Makes me want to go over to the scoreboard and like unplug it. You're like, oh, bummer. I guess the game's over and we were ahead. So we're good. We're done. The Lord promises to basically to do just that. But then you also get language like this, that he's slow 
in other areas, even though he's trying to be quick in that one, or language like Lehi's when he says that God prolongs the days of the children of men, that he lengthens them. And why would he do that? To give them opportunity to repent. Isn't that what Jonah did? 40 days. God will lengthen that time. And if you use it well, then destruction will not come. Here, I think a similar message is coming from Nahum, for the Ninevites and for all of us. Yes, God is slow to anger, but it will come when your 40 days are up. That period of, pers- of, of preparation and purification. I cannot prolong your days indefinitely. Otherwise, the days can't be shortened and no flesh will be saved. Put those two verses side by side, those two concepts, and God is between a rock and a hard place. I want to shorten the days so our team wins, but I want to lengthen the days because I love the people on the other side, on the other team, and I just want them to cross the field or come across the court and join the winning team. That's what I'm waiting for. You understand why it's so dangerous for us to procrastinate the days of our repentance? It doesn't allow God to cut short his work in righteousness. It doesn't allow him to shorten the days so that more of us can be saved. So please be careful. Be grateful for the fact that God is slow to anger. But, be, but realize what we're up against. Because it's allowing the wicked world to continue to build its own momentum. So we need to repent. Now, verse 4 and 5, Nahum goes on and continues to talk about God's power. He says, He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. Those three places, by the way, Bashan with all of its oaks and and fat cows, the kind that that, uh, Amos talked about. Uh, Carmel is synonymous with the dews of Carmel. It's where the contest with the priests of Baal was. Lots of good weather there. Okay, growth and flourishing. Lebanon, well, there's the cedars of Lebanon. Best trees in the Middle East. And yet what's happening in all of those areas? They're languishing. They're withering, dying on the vine. He goes on, the mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. There's a nod to what Zephaniah will do because he's talking about the whole globe by now, the earth, the world. Now, that's the God you're up against, Nineveh. Not just the God of little provincial Palestine. This is the God of the universe. This is the king of creation. Haven't you heard some of his stories about rebuking the sea, the Red Sea, and having Israel cross on dry ground? Drying up the river? How about stopping the Jordan so they could come into their promised land? I'm I'm that God. (laughs) I'm the same God. And I'm still jealously loyal to my people. So be careful how you feel about boasting in your own strength. Because, in fact, let me put it this way. When he speaks of drying up rivers, because Isaiah... Isaiah really is a key to understand a lot of what we're going to see today. Isaiah talks about the coming of the Assyrians as a flood, as a river that comes in and then parts its ways and just floods Israel with devastation. And yet here, what is Nahum saying? Yeah, God can dry up rivers. That includes your river, Assyria. You know, you might seem, it, it might seem like you have an army as innumerable as the the sands of the sea, drops of water in this ocean of officers. And yet, what do I do with the sea? I rebuke it. Don't feel... See, this is another gift that Isaiah gives us when he says... uh, Remember he describes Assyria as a rod, but it's the Lord's chastening rod, and he's using Assyria to try to guide Israel back to where they need to go. But then he says, but if that rod starts to boast itself and shake itself against its owner, its bearer, then time to replace the rod. If the axe starts to boast itself against the one that's hewing with it, then no, axe, I'm the one doing the work. You're just my instrument. Same with the saw that thinks it's doing all the cutting and and is oblivious to the hand on the handle. You Remember all that from Isaiah? You're getting a similar sense here from Nahum that Ninevites, the people of Assyria, God used you 
as an instrument to correct and chasten his own covenant people. But the moment you start taking glory to yourself is the moment that you're no longer God's instrument. You're now fully God's enemy and you will be consumed by someone else. The same thing's going to happen with the Babylonians once we get to Habakkuk. Okay, interesting parallels here. But then in, read in verse 6 through 8 some fascinating questions. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? You think it's you, Assyria? You really think you can handle this just because you've conquered all these other gods? No. His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. So please do not underestimate God's justice. Then again, what's he say in the next line? The Lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Then again, swing the pendulum back, but with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Once again, we see approving of contraries. Once again, we see correct one extreme, but don't overcorrect into the opposite extreme. Balance, justice, and mercy here. Or another way to say it would be to the enemy, let me remind you of my indignation and the fierceness of my anger. To my own covenant people, may I remind you that I am good, that I am a stronghold in the day of trouble. That should also be a reminder of, for the enemies because you're not just t taking on my people, you're taking on me. And I am a stronghold that you will not be able to breach. Again, for those who are struggling with enemies, that is, that's powerful language. And if you feel like you are under siege to sin and that temptation is coming to knock down your walls, if doubt seems to be finding its way through every keyhole, rest assured that the Lord who is good is our stronghold. And anytime you are in trouble, know that you are behind his walls. Remember what he said through Isaiah? Thy walls are continually before me. He doesn't just have watchmen on the tower and watchmen on the walls. He is our wall. He is our refuge. And he is a stronghold because he knows those that trust in him. I love that phrase as well. He knoweth them that trust in him. He knows them because they obviously know him. That's why they trust in him. And having that much faith in his power, in his goodness, in his strength, then why would I ever fear my enemy? In fact, why wouldn't my enemy fear my God? Who can stand before his indignation? No one. Not even the mighty Assyrian Empire. Nahum then adds in verse 9 and 10 another question for them to consider. What do ye imagine against the Lord? That is such an important thing to consider. What are we imagining against him? What kind of a God are you envisioning? What do you picture him to be? He goes on. He will make an utter end. Don't, don't, don't doubt that just because his anger is slow in coming and that you've been conquering kingdom after kingdom before you. Oh, he will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. God's going to take care of business the first. For while they be folded together as thorns and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. After all, the sea has been rebuked and the rivers have been, <laughs> have been stopped. Where's, where are the dews of Carmel now? Th this, all that's left is stubble fully dry, which means that field, the good grain has already been harvested. All that's left is this stubble and the field is ready to be burned in preparation of next year's planting. And that's you, Assyria, all that's left of you or all that will be left of you is stubble fully dry. Why? Because you are imagining things about the God of Israel that just aren't true. What kind of a God did you think he was? One that was easily vanquished like the gods of all the other 
kingdoms you've conquered? I mean, just remember when Rabshakeh, the Assyrian general, gets down to uh, Jerusalem and starts talking smack at the city walls in Hebrew so he can strike fear into the hearts of every soldier? Remember what he says as he talks smack about the God of Israel? But it's just his imaginings of that God, thinking that he is powerless. No better than any other God of any other kingdom. Whereas King Hezekiah knew at that exact moment, why are you comparing our God to their gods? Because those aren't any gods. Ours is different. Ours is the only one. And so be careful what you imagine against him. He will be no pushover. He will not be someone that allows you to conquer his land at his people's expense. Oh, he he will use you to correct them and chasten them. But he's the one doing the correcting, not you. Now, before we move on, Can I take a moment and add one last wrinkle to make it more applicable to us? And I want us all to ponder that that initial question. What do we imagine against the Lord? Or what do we imagine about the Lord? What what kind of a God do we think he is? Now, through much of, of Protestant history, especially through Calvinism, when John Calvin split off his group in the Protestant Reformation, he tried more than anything to guard the sovereignty of God, which is a good thing. But he did it to such an extent that he turned God into an unapproachable deity that people tended to obey out of fear rather than follow out of love. It's that mentality that that brings on sinners in the hands of an angry God, that famous sermon from Jonathan Edwards, that God looks at you like a spider that he's dangling over the pit of hell. He looks at you with disgust and loathing. Uh, not, is that what you're imagining God to be? Are you imagining him to be all vengeance and fury and wrath, like we saw in a previous verse? And have you lost sight of his goodness? Have you lost sight of the fact that he is slow to anger? Because many a Calvinist di- did. Now, as contraries go, usually when a culture for a time is at one extreme, then eventually a new generation will come that is countercultural and tries to correct that, that imbalance, unfortunately, usually by overcorrecting it. And while one gener- so when, when one generation erred on the side of God is too just, subsequent generations tend to err on the side of God being too merciful. And that does seem to describe the way we imagine things about God in our day. And we have turned him into a pushover. We have said that he's so slow to anger that he never gets angry at all. And that's not the case. If in the old days, justice robbed mercy, in our day, mercy robs justice. And those are false imaginings either way. In fact, if I could add one thing to your vocabulary... This is a fascinating thing that several Protestant researchers have figured out. That what is going wrong with religion in our day? Why are people leaving it or not fully living into it? Uh, They've come up with what they call a parasitic faith. It's almost this, this cancer that's working its way into denominations across the board. And doesn't become its own denomination. It just... It parasitically attaches itself to other churches' beliefs and starts to suck out the spiritual strength from within. Sound intriguing? (laughs) Sound concerning? Because guess what? The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not immune to this parasitic faith either. They call it moralistic therapeutic deism, which admittedly doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. I mean, no wonder they don't have the moralistic therapeutic deistic first ward uh, or as its own denomination. No, instead it's much more insidious because it takes God for who he is and then imagines things about him that, that destroy the whole idea of who our Father in Heaven really is. I'll give you some examples. The moralistic side would say, well, as people of faith, we're supposed to be moralistic, which isn't even quite moral, uh, but close. 
uh, it's watered down a belief in holiness and self-sacrifice and repentance, self-discipline, self-denial. Instead, let's just boil it down to an easy, lowest common denominator, and let's be moralistic in terms of let's be nice to people. Now, it's important to be nice to people, don't get me wrong, but this is a niceness that prioritizes do no harm in terms of, well, how are people going to feel about themselves? Let's just you do you. That's the, the clarion call of, moral, of moral, moralism instead of true morality. You see, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to make anybody feel bad. And so if I just have love, and again, remember last week, that's one of the ideographics, the ideographs in our day that's untouchable. Moralistic therapeutic deism trades on love with no limits. Love divorced from law. It's all about the second great commandment without much concern for the first great commandment. You see how it would be so parasitic? How it can attach itself in, in religions? Because it sounds pretty good to start. Just make sure everyone feels good and, and they're accepted exactly as they are. It's the come as you are, which is true, but you can also leave as you were, which is not how God approaches things. There's the moralistic. The therapeutic is along those same lines. The greatest goal is that we all feel comfortable in our own skin and aren't asked to change because sometimes those can be hard sayings. Who can hear them? I mean, the wicked take the truth to be hard. So let's avoid those hard truths. And let's just tell people what they want to hear. Let's scratch the itching ear. Let's Let's do what the priest of Noah did to the people of King Noah of just, hey, there's no law, so there's no sin, so there's no reason to feel guilt. How's that for good therapy? Therapeutic? You understand why that, you, they use that term? It's less about prophets crying repentance and more about therapists making sure people feel very comfortable in their circumstances. And I'm not saying anything negative against therapists. Please don't get me wrong, okay? But when religion has become that, and there is no set standard. There's no ultimate truth or, or divinely designed right and wrong. Then that's all we're left with is therapeuticism. And then the deism, that's an interesting view because it still acknowledges God. But the God of deism, that was the God of Thomas Paine, is distant Unless you need him to come through in the clutch at some moment. But for the most part, you kind of just do it on your own. Because eh, if God were present in our lives, he'd probably be telling us what to do. And that's not good therapy. He'd ask us to be holy and not just nice. And I'd rather just be content with my moralism. You see what this, where these scholars are coming from? I was blown away by this insight and, and frankly concerned that I see its presence in my own faith. Culturally, that is. Uh, and to me, that question is something I want to linger in our minds a little more often than it does. What do we imagine against the Lord? And is the Lord trying to break through those imaginings and reintroduce himself as a Lord of love? Yes, but also a Lord of law. As a God who, yes, is slow to anger but also has commandments he expects us to live. This is, this is who we worship. This is how we worship him. This is life eternal that we might know God and Jesus Christ and know them for who they really are. No imaginings at all. A God of great expectations. A God of covenant and jealous to keep us in it for our sake. Maybe we could chew on that a little longer. But Nahum moves forward and says in verse 11 and 12, there is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord. Same phrase he used back in verse nine. What are you imagining? Well, let me introduce you to someone who is, who's imagining evil. He's a wicked counselor. I honestly wonder if he's referring to Rabshakeh that Assyrian general who comes and boasts and taunts and scares the soldiers. Here's a wicked counselor. Now, thus saith the Lord to that type of person. This is the message he would give to someone like Rabshakeh. Though they be quiet and likewise many, 
yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Now, by quiet and many, what he means by this is you might feel like you have all kinds of allies or all kinds of armies at your command. Yeah, yes, they are many. And is that what is giving you this sense of peace and quiet? You have so much flesh on the arm in which to trust that you think you're invincible against the puny God of Israel. Well, talk about imagining evil against him. So what's the message to, the, to you? You'll be cut down as soon as I pass through. And the only reason I haven't passed through yet is to give you time to repent. I am slow to anger after all. And then it, he seems to shift gears and address the Israelites themselves with this next phrase in verse 12. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. My covenant people, yes, Assyria has been chastening you. They have been the rod in my hand, but now I'm going to break that rod over my knee because it's boasting itself. It thinks it's doing the correction, and no, they are obscuring my mighty hand, and I can't allow that to happen. You will be delivered, Israel. Even those in their scattered condition will ultimately be gathered again. A righteous remnant shall remain, right, Sher Yashu? Those who are not my people can still be my people, right? Lo Ami, I mean Ami. You understand all these prophets and all the, the shared messages that they are collectively trying to give to their audience as well as to each of us? I do love that phrase. Yes, I've afflicted you. I'll afflict you no more. In a little wrath, Isaiah said, have I hid my face from thee. But with everlasting kindness will I gather thee. I get the same feeling from this passage. Nahum then gives us this in 13 and 14. For now will I break his yoke off thee and will burst thy bonds in sunder. This is the people of God finally being free of foreign oppression. And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee. Now he seems to be talking back to the Assyrians. That no more of thy name be sown. In other words, you won't have any posterity to pass down your name. Your name won't be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. And again, I think that has a literal fulfillment in the story of of Rabshakeh and Sennacherib. Because remember what Sennacherib, when, when there's this devastation among the army that's been camped out outside Jerusalem, was it 185,000 casualties overnight as the destroying angel came tearing through? And Sennacherib turns tail and runs back to Nineveh, Nahum's target audience, where he is slain in the temple of his own gods by his own sons. How's that for being cut off from posterity? In his case, cut off by posterity. How's that for no name being sown? How's that for graven images and molten images cutting you off? Your own temple, your own so-called deities. It's all happening to the Assyrians. Then in verse 15, he seems to switch back to the Israelites. That, this is one of the things that makes Nahum difficult. Uh, it's poetry, that makes it hard already, but it seems like he switches back and forth really quickly without even giving us the heads up of, is this line for Assyria and is this line for Israel? Is it all meant for, ah, how, does, how do we do this? You kind of have to just read into the context and understand, oh, he couldn't possibly be saying this to the Assyrians uh, when he says, I'm not going to afflict you anymore. No, that's got to be for his own people. And same thing with this in verse 15. How's this for a message of hope for his covenant people? Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. That verse should ring some bells from Isaiah, from Abinadi, from Jesus. All kinds of people have quoted that same concept of beautiful feet upon the mountains because they're publishing peace. And why is there peace now in the promised land? Because a bunch of other feet, the Assyrian ones, have turned tail and run back home to Nineveh. And if they don't repent, there'll be no chance to run any further because the Babylonians are on their way. That's the big 
warning that you see in chapter 2. Verse 1 and 2, he says, He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. And the other translations simplify or shorten that. Instead of he that dasheth in pieces, it's simply a shatterer. Or another translation, a scatterer. Mm, okay, now we're getting closer. The scattering of the northern kingdom, the lost ten tribes, that will happen at the hands of the Assyrians. So he that dasheth in pieces, this scatterer, is come up before thy face. Keep the munition, watch the way, make thy loins strong, fortify thy power mightily. For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. For the empty ears have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. Now, I just said that Nahum is difficult, among other reasons, because it's often hard to tell who his audience is in a given line. This one is a particularly difficult passage because is he speaking to Assyria or is he speaking to Judah? Uh, is he talking about Assyria coming to dash in pieces Israel? Or is he talking about someone else, Babylonians, coming to dash the Assyrians into pieces? Hmm, that's, that's a tricky one. Uh, in some ways, the answer could be both. Because, yes, beware, people of Israel and Judah, a scatterer is coming from the north, Assyria, to scatter you to the four winds. But then again, be careful, Assyrians, a scatterer is coming, the Babylonians, and they will conquer your kingdom and destroy you. But even that next phrase about the Lord turning away the excellency of Jacob, that's a tricky one to translate also, because is it a turning away or a turning back? In other words, if this is a message to the Assyrians saying, I'm going to turn away the splendor of Jacob. Or is it a message to the people of Israel saying, I will restore again. I'll turn it back to you, all your former glory in the day of the gathering. It's really hard to tell just on the surface level. I guess in some ways we're left with this either way possibility, but that makes it all the more meaningful for us just to insert ourselves and say, well, either way, how does it relate to me? If a scatterer is coming, if I'm up against an enemy out there, what should I do by way of preparation? I love his list. Keep the munition. The NIV says, guard the fortress. The ESV says, man the ramparts. All these other translations really do give some added insight. And for us to prepare for whatever's coming, that, that's really good counsel. Guard the fortress. Look up to the watchmen on the tower and honor their warnings and their words. Do we have enough ammunition? How sharp is the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God that we're supposed to be wielding? How's, how's my armor? And have I taken upon myself the whole armor of God? Or just, just some bits and pieces? How's my shield of faith? Is my faith broad enough to protect everything about me? Or am I hiding behind something much, much smaller? Keep the munition. Watch the way. Great advice also. And in fact, watch the watchers of the way. Keep your eyes on prophets and apostles who are trying to prepare us. Make thy loins strong, great counsel there as well. Brace yourself, get ready, whether that's spiritually or temporally, whether that's mentally or emotionally. And finally, fortify thy power mightily. Fortify your power. Are you strengthening those around you? They may come back to strengthen or even save you. We're all in this together. And for us to do these things in the face of whatever shatterers and scatterers are, are joining against us, this is good advice for us to follow. Because the battle is coming. It's already here. As Elder Maxwell said, it's a real war with real casualties. And we know far too many of those casualties personally. So notice what Nahum says in verse 3 and 4. The shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. Are we picturing blood red soldiers? The chariot shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. Some render that glittering chariots. That's the flaming torches. It's sunlight reflecting, flashing off the metal. 
the fir tree shall be terribly shaken. Some suggest, is, is, this, is he depicting a forest of spears being brandished before the enemy? Looks like a, a pine forest and all they're shaking as they're coming forward, marching towards the foe. The chariots shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another in the broad ways. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like the lightnings. And again, their scholars suggest these chariots flashing around like fire, darting around like lightning. This is intense battle imagery. Is this what the Israelites are facing as the Assyrians are bearing down on them? Is this what the Assyrians are facing as the Babylonians bear down on them? All of the above. Is it what we're facing with the wicked world? Does it sometimes feel like we're up against a forest of fir trees, spears shaking before us, chariots on the move, jostling one against the other? Who can come and bear down on us fastest and first? This, and yet, flip it all around. Because how does the Lord describe his kingdom upon the earth? Fair as the sun, clear as the moon, and terrible as an army with banners. We've got a few fir trees of our own that we can shake in the face of the enemy. There's something powerful about all of this, but it is battle imagery. It is a real war. And we need to be mustering our forces, preparing. In verse 5 and 7, he goes on, He shall recount his worthies, and this is most likely the king, that's the he, shouting to his officers, that's, those are the worthies, they shall stumble in their walk, they shall make haste to the wall thereof, and the defense shall be prepared, but it's going to be too little too late. He warns, the gates of the rivers shall be opened, and Nineveh was built on the Tigris River. Some scholars have even suggested in the battle when Assyria was attacked and Nineveh was leveled by the Babylonians, was there flooding at that time? Were the gates of the rivers opened? The palace shall be dissolved as the whole city is brought to its knees. And Huzab shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up and her maids shall lead her as with the voice of doves tabering upon their breasts. That last image is that of slaves, these maids moaning and mourning, cooing like doves, it sounds, as they beat themselves in the chest as a sign of lamentation. Do you remember when Isaiah talks about the fall of Babylon and how devastated Babylon will feel, and yet the rest of the world will rejoice? That's the case in Revelation chapter 18, when Babylon is brought to its knees, the merchant city is now out of business and everyone is lamenting that, well, how am I going to buy and purchase and sell and, and get ahead in life? Well, that's what's happening here. The city has been dissolved. The, the mighty have stumbled in the way. And while that's bad news for the Ninevites, that is good news for the Israelites. Their enemy is being defeated. In verse 8, Nineveh is of old like a pool of water, yet they shall flee away. Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. The New International Version renders that first line, Nineveh is like a pool whose water is draining away. Do you remember Jeremiah's old warning that Israel had committed two sins? The first was rejecting the Lord, but the second was replacing him with a broken cistern. You had a fountain of living water and instead you gave that up to, to carve out a leaky swimming pool? A, a broken cistern? That's the idea behind this passage with the Ninevites. You're a pool that is draining away. All of your strength is seeping through the fissures in the rock. And even though you're standing there trying to stay strong, stand, stand, they're, they're, they're told. They will flee and none will look back. This is full retreat. And in now, instead of buying all of your wares, you merchant city, what are they doing? They're plundering her riches. Verse 9 and 10, Take ye the spoil of silver. Take the spoil of gold. For there is none end of the store and glory out of all the pleasant furniture. At least that's what it seems like. It seems like there's an, an infinite supply. Oh no, just, we just wait. It'll quickly run out. To the point that then she'll say, 
she is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins and the faces of them all gather blackness. Great imagery for fear, for trembling. There's nothing left in the merchant city. It's all been clean, cleaned out. Nothing left for Babylon, or in this case, Assyria, to offer you. Verse 11 and 12, where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion, even the old lion, walked and the, young, and the lions whelp, and none made them afraid. In other words, what's now become of Nineveh, where all the old lions prowled? He says, the lion did tear in pieces enough for his whelps, and strangled for his lionesses, and filled his holes with prey, and his dens with raven. At least the old way they did. You see, lions were prominent in Assyrian art as the symbol of the empire. That's how strong and mighty we are. Uh, in America, we talk about the American eagle. But in England, they talk about the British lion. And the Assyrian lion was along those lines. And yet, how is it being described now? Sure, in the old days, you could tear pieces enough to feed your young, to provide for the lionesses. But that day is over. And there will be nothing left for you. Remember that scene in The Lion King, that Disney movie, when Scar is in charge? He's driven out, or Muf he killed Mufasa, drove out uh, Simba. <laughs> it's been a while since I've seen this. My kids are too old now. Uh, but when, the, when Pride Rock is no longer surrounded by, by the fertile savanna, it's now, it's now death and destruction as far as the eye can see. It's the realm for scavengers, hyenas, instead of the lion presiding as king of the beasts. It's interesting to see Assyria along those lines. And for us to picture a wicked world in that kind of imagery, why would I put all my eggs in that basket? If I were to... It's like, why did I hold on to my stock in Blockbuster Video? I, mean, I didn't. I don't have any stock. Uh, but that, it no longer exists. And for us to put our stock in Assyria or buy bonds in Babylon, it's not worth it. Because that, yeah, a, it looks like a lion today. There's a, a, a bull market. No, it will be brought down like a bear. It will be an old lion that can no longer provide for its pride. In verse 13 then, he concludes this chapter, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts. I will burn her chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour thy young lions, and I will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messengers shall no more be heard. I mean, what did you expect when you turned against the God of Israel? He's not someone you want to offend. He's a God worth coming to know and coming to honor and obey and follow. Don't imagine things against him. He's not that kind of God. And then Nahum gives one last chapter, which contains one last warning to his target audience there in Nineveh. In verse 1, 2, and 3, he says, Woe to the bloody city. So there you get an, an image of violence. It is all full of lies and robbery. So there you get an image of corruption. Remember those, violence and corruption. The prey departeth not. And you could read that to suggest that it's got such a stranglehold upon its people that no one can escape. The prey departeth not. Then again, the New International Version translates that they are never without victims. So there's always prey. It never departs. until It's always, there's always another, uh, every day breeds another, a new sucker. Someone else that I can pawn off my wares and, and purchase their souls with what they're purchasing from me. There's always more blood to shed, more lies to tell, more robberies to commit. So he says, the noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots, all that noise of war. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain, a great number of carcasses. There is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. That's a pretty disgusting visual image. Massive casualties, 
corpses and carcasses as far as the eye can see? Well, in a way, this reminds me of the flood. Massive casualties on a global scale. Because of what? If you remember the way Noah described it and what he cried repentance against, it was violence and corruption, just like you're seeing here. A bloody city full of lies and robbery. And does, has our violence crossed the point of no return? Has our corruption gotten to the point where have we gone too far? Or can we change, turn things around, repent? In verse 4 and 5, it gets worse for them, hopefully not for us. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts, that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts, behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. The way he's describing violence and corruption in verse 1, 2, and 3 now turns into immorality and idolatry in 4 and 5. You see an objectification of people and a commodification of people, and prostitution is such an example of that, where a person has become completely objectified, and now their own person, their body, becomes a commodity to buy or sell. That's what... Spiritual Babylon, or spiritual Assyria, has always been after. Again, you see that in Revelation 18, where there's a whole list of things. It's like the Sears catalog, the Wells Fargo wagon, uh, Amazon Prime Black Friday deals. And they're being advertised, and the way it's described, it's all this amazing stuff, and precious stones, and, and wood, and spices, and all these things. But then it gets down to the end, and you really see in the, in the fine print what, he's, what Babylon or Assyria has been after all along. What are they really selling? Slaves and souls of men. It's a chilling passage there in Revelation 18. Equally chilling here in Nahum to see personified as a prostitute, talk about a slave once the soul of a man or woman has come under bondage. And what's the Lord going to do since that prostitute still will not repent? He's going to turn that, he's going to discover her skirt and show the nation their nakedness. Now, you remember back in Isaiah chapter 3 when I talked about the daughters of Zion and he basically turned them inside out so the world could see what they were really made of on the inside. A whited sepulcher. So let's clear out the whitewashing on the outside and show the inside full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. That's how Jesus teaches it. In Isaiah's case, forget the well-set hair. Look at, for, at the reality, which is baldness. Forget the, the, the trappings of beauty on the outside because inside there's nothing but filth. And this prostitute, who again is going to try to look as good as possible on the outside so she can successfully commodify herself. The day will come where she will be stripped naked to the point where everyone sees exactly what she is. No makeup on. No finery. And they will turn away in disgust as she turns away in shame. Remember, nakedness means you're not covered and covering is the Hebrew word for atonement. They're left with none of that. He then says in verse 6 and 7, I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile. I will set thee as a gazing stock, which is so fitting. Since the world used to look at you in wonder, in awe, oh, mighty Assyria, mighty Babylon. But now it's still looking, but it's looking for a completely different reason. How has the city fallen? As Revelation 18 says, Oh, how, how art thou fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning, as Isaiah 14 says. Nahum goes on, It shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee, and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who shall bemoan her? Whence shall I seek comforters for thee? And remember Nahum's name means comfort. There's been one here all this time. A prophet. You just won't listen to him. You'd rather turn away from that comfort. And what will you be left with? 
you'll be wasted. People will bemoan you, which again is what we saw in Isaiah 14 and Revelation 18. Bemoaning a wicked world that is no longer giving us all the, the pleasures that we once enjoyed. Nahum then says in verse 8 through 10, Art thou better than populous No? And No is the city of Thebes. It was a major city in southern Egypt. It's one that Assyria had already conquered. And so def definitely felt like, oh yeah, we, we can handle, we're, we're stronger than Egypt. We're better than populous No. Oh, are you really? He says, that was situate among the rivers, that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea and her wall was from the sea. Oh, Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lubium were her, thy helpers. You see, Thebes had all kinds of allies. But how'd that turn out for her? You Assyrians should know, since you conquered her, no one could defend her. Well, now the roles will reverse. He says, yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets, and they cast lots for her honorable men. All her great men were bound in chains. You know this, Assyria. Egypt couldn't stand up to you. You were the bigger fish, but there's a still bigger one waiting right behind you. And just like Egypt could not stand up to Assyria, Assyria will not be able to stand up to Babylon. Again, there's an underlying message here. Since there's so many fish waiting in the wings to come and gobble their predecessor. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream that Daniel interpreted? We've got a whole statue here. And yes, the head of gold will collapse in favor of the chest of silver or the trunk of bronze or the legs of iron or the feet of iron and clay. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go, an hour of pomp, an hour of show. That's all there is, though. And yet, what's the last one? What finally defeated the entire statue? Oh, yeah, the stone. A stone cut out of the mountain without hands. This is good news for Israel. Thy Lord reigneth. And Zion will be the biggest fish of them all. He will it will swallow every earthly kingdom that went before it. In verse 11 and 12, he says, Thou also shalt be drunken, or you'll stagger like a drunkard when you see all this. Thou shalt be hid, or in other words, you'll go into hiding. Thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. You'll want to hide among them. You'll seek refuge, allies, arm of strength, anywhere you can find it. But none of that's going to work. He says, All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken... They shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. That's a great analogy. On my mission, uh, Puerto Rico, it was so lush, so tropical, that there were always trees. Fruit was always in season. And we would walk by, fruit, uh, by trees uh, just on our walks, you know, out in the streets or in the countryside, and there'd be a lemon tree, and grab a lemon or an orange tree or a mango tree, and there was just always fruit everywhere. If it was high in the branches and you couldn't climb up to it, well, if it was sufficiently ripe, all you had to do was shake a branch and it would drop off, and you could catch it. Well, that's how easy a harvest it will be for the Babylonians when they finally come bearing down upon the Assyrians. <laughs> you Assyrians, all Babylon has to do is shake you, and you will fall right into their devouring mouth. Next in verse 13, Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women, which is certainly no longer politically correct. But what he basically just said there is, you guys fight like girls. Okay? Thy people in the midst of thee are women. That's, he's reducing them to that as far as this, is these manly armies are concerned. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Those would be the bars keeping the gates closed. If fire can devour those, think how easily the gates can be forced open. You see how he's portraying Nineveh as completely defenseless, wide open to attack, no one to be able to defend you? How was that for the arm of flesh? It's looking kind of withered these days. He then adds in verse 14 and 15, draw the waters for the siege. That's what King Hezekiah had been trying to do to get, dig that tunnel and get the water in. That way we have sources of living water within, no longer just broken cisterns. 
So draw thee waters for the siege. Fortify thy strongholds. Are we returning to that earlier advice we got about ha having your munitions and guarding your, your walls and making sure that the troops are in order? So draw waters, fortify strongholds, go into clay, tread the mortar, make strong the brick kiln. That way you can fortify things. You can add another layer of protection, mount ever higher the walls and the towers. Because what are you up against? There shall the fire devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Oh yes, make thyself many as the canker worm. Make thyself many as the locusts. These armies of devouring insects will come to infest the land. So you better get ready for it. it. Makes me wonder, honestly, if Nahum is speaking sarcastically there in this part of his poem. Just saying there's nothing you're going to be able to do. Because like locusts, the Babylonians will descend upon you and leave nothing in their wake. But once again, if this is advice that the Assyrians would not accept, is it counsel that we are willing to follow? Like we saw in the earlier passage, can we implement these tactics and preparations as well? Can we draw water? Do we have sufficient living water to survive the drought? Are our strongholds sufficiently fortified? Do we have the Lord on our side? Are we prepared for the battle? Unfortunately for the Assyrians, when they should have been multiplying troops, since the enemy troops will be multiplied like the locusts, what were they multiplying instead? Look at verse 16 and 17. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The cankerworm spoileth and fleeth away. The crowned are as the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. These, the problem with the Ninevites, the Assyrians, they were so focused on self-aggrandizement, self-promotion, that they didn't take any time for self-protection. They wanted to get ahead temporally, and it cost them to the point they could no longer stay ahead militarily. In our case, are we guilty of similar problems where we put all our eggs in, in the world's basket instead of in the basket of Zion, of, of, of God? And when we should have been multiplying our spiritual strength, instead we just kept checking our bank balance. No wonder he then says in verse 18 and 19, Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap the hands over thee, for upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually. And with that final question, he ends his little book. It's interesting because his partner prophet, Jonah, if you want to put them together, they're both crying repentance against Nineveh. They're both warning them of coming destruction. Nahum didn't want the destruction to happen. Jonah did. In Jonah's case, his book ended with a question too. And it was that question left lingering in the air. Should not I spare Nineveh? Well, if you answer Jonah's final question with Nahum's final question, the answer would be no. It was yes in Jonah's case because the people repented. It's no in Nahum's case because the people did not. But the question here, upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? Of course there's no one to comfort you. No Nahum in your life because you've rejected me. You've rejected God and you have attacked Everyone in your path, conquering kingdom after kingdom, who hasn't your wickedness affected negatively? Makes you wonder if the Lord has similar words of warning to the wicked world in our day. Or to the adversary of our souls, to whom the Lord can also say, upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually. Every one of us is a member of the walking wounded as all of us have wounds, however grievous. But unlike Assyria's wounds, 
where Nahum said, there is no healing for thy bruises. There is healing for ours. And it comes through the ultimate Nahum, the ultimate comforter and consoler, even Jesus Christ. To understand his role in all of this, that he, talk about a shepherd that does not slumber. While we are scattered upon the mountains, God is sending forth hunters and fishers to find us wherever we might be. He is sending out his chosen people to find those that would be chosen, if only they knew how. There seems to be that promise implied by this final passage. Assyria, it's too late for them, but it's not too late for us. And if we will trust in the God of Israel, if we will stop imagining evil things against him, if we will know that his anger is slow in coming and that his mercy is ever extended, if we'll only take it and change, then hope lies ahead for us rather than destruction. We will outlive the Assyrians. And that's the promise that Nahum gives to us all. The challenge comes with Habakkuk because the Assyrians are simply replaced by the Babylonians. And just because you overcame one temptation doesn't mean you're forever off the hook because another enemy is waiting in the wings, another empire that swallowed up the one you were so concerned about. Ooh, is this an even bigger challenge ahead? Well, Babylon becomes the one that is ultimately synonymous with the wicked world. It's the image that, keep, that, that future prophets will always fall back on including throughout the Doctrine and Covenants. So as we turn to the book of Habakkuk, we see how so much of what Nahum was saying about the Assyrians, Habakkuk is going to say about the Babylonians. Now, as I said at the beginning of this week's lesson, we know precious little about Habakkuk, other than the fact that he was a prophet. Habakkuk is writing against the Babylonians, so we assume that he must have been later chronologically than Nahum was most likely in the years leading up to the Babylonian destruction, uh, which would make him a contemporary or near contemporary of people like Jeremiah and Lehi or Ezekiel and Daniel, although he's on the, the, the front end instead of the back end. Because of that timing and because of the strength of his message, there's amazing things that we'll see in the next three chapters. He's actually brought up in an apocryphal book called Bell and the Dragon. Uh, Bell and the Dragon is an interesting work. It's kind of like fan fiction on the book of, of Daniel. Because <laughs> Daniel would have been a, a near contemporary as well. But da Daniel's off in Babylon. In fact, at some point when Daniel's in the lion's den, according to this apocryphal book, uh, an angel comes to see Habakkuk back in Israel. And he picks up Habakkuk by the hair and whisks him off to Babylon. Uh, food in hand. He's been out gathering food, I believe. And he drops him off in the lion's den, where Habakkuk then feeds Daniel. Now, again, this is all apocryphal. Uh, but I do love the thought of, okay, yeah, the king of Persia was fasting that night. The lions were fasting that night. But I guess Daniel didn't have to. Habakkuk came through for him. Either that or he was using his own food to keep the lions at bay. I don't know. Uh, but what's interesting, again, is that this later author, whoever wrote the book Bell and the Dragon, decided on Habakkuk as one of their heroes. Well, that, we would say, is, is non-scriptural and non-historical. But what Habakkuk does give us lets us know why he should be our hero. What he writes is amazing. So verse 1 and 2 of chapter 1, and the beginning of his book is amazing. It starts with a familiar phrase, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. And in his case, you probably could take the word burden even more literally than usual, because his people at this time were suffering under the burden of Babylon. But whereas most prophets then begin by speaking for God, Habakkuk begins by speaking to him. And he's got a question that's been weighing heavy as part of this burden. He says, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? Does that sound like Job? God, why am I suffering when I'm righteous and don't deserve it? Does it sound like Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail? 
O God, where art thou, and where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? How long will thy pure eye see what we're suffering? How long will your ear be pierced with our cries, and yet you do nothing to help us? That was Joseph's Habakkuk moment. But if you recall what the Israelites or what the people of Judah are up against, the northern kingdom's already been scattered by the Assyrians, but now the Babylonians are bearing down on us and we're about to be destroyed. That was Jeremiah's caution and warning all throughout his ministry. And here's Habakkuk wondering why and how long. In some ways, yes, we deserve it. But I've been crying repentance my whole ministry, and so has every other prophet that we could name. And will the people change before it's too late? Or will we be destroyed by the Babylonians? Because even those of us that are repentant and are worthy, are we going to suffer alongside the wicked? How long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? That is a hard you know, that's a verse in Habakkuk that we quote even without knowing it. When we're suffering, when we're struggling, when we're wondering where God is in all of this. This is the problem of evil. This is what they call theodicy. But in a more personal vein, this is what we call human suffering. And we all deal with it. Whether or not we voice that exact question. He, goes, he builds on the question in verse 3 and 4 wondering, why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. There's spiritual problems, there's social problems, there's economic problems everywhere the eye can see. Why are you showing that to me? Why are you making me behold it? He then says, therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Have you ever felt that way? Just wondering why things are the way they are and wondering if they'll ever get better, if things will ever change. Do we sometimes worry that the law is slacked and not just human law, not doing what it's supposed to, to protect the innocent and punish the guilty, but even divine law, what's taking so long? That's... Habakkuk's concern. That's the Israelites, the people of Judah's concern. It's the early saints' concern. It's often our own. And do we sometimes feel like we're caught in this endless loop of iniquity and there's no way to get out of it? Will the Savior ever come? Hasten the day. Cut short your work in righteousness. Well, verse 5, the answer starts to come. Behold ye among the heathen and regard. So look at this. And wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. Now that is one of those passages that has such a long afterlife. What you see here, first of all, you will wonder marvelously. Does that sound like Isaiah's marvelous work and a wonder? It's the same thing. And what was he referring to? The restoration. It's going to blow your mind. In fact, the way Habakkuk says it, I love. You're not going to believe it even if I tell it to you. I mean, you're going to have to see it. You're going to have to behold this wonder. And it'll leave you wondering. <laughs> Jaw drop, you'll be marveling. Like, is this real? Rubbing your eyes. Am I seeing really what I'm seeing? Because God is finally coming through. Everything I wished for, prayed for, hoped for has happened. And it's unbelievable. That's the fun thing about that word unbelievable. It's, it's so hard to, it's so good, it's hard to believe. It's the word incredible. When you think of it, that, that's incredible. But incredible, if it's not credible, it's not believable. It's the same idea there. And that's what I love about when the, the restoration is incredible. When somebody, you know, some skeptic out there says, now I just can't believe in... Joseph Smith or the, or the Book of Mormon, I can't believe, or even, you know, Christian skeptics or skeptics of Christianity, I should say, I can't believe in an atonement. I can't believe in a resurrection. Part of me wants to say, yeah, neither can I, but I do. I'll admit it is unbelievable, <laughs> but in the most amazing of ways. Yes, it is incredible, but that's what makes it all the more incredible because it's true. 
And what you're going to see will wipe away all that you've been suffering through. Because God will, God will come through for you. It's his marvelous work. It's his wonder. Yes, it'll seem too good to be true. But it's true. No wonder Paul quotes that verse to the astounded Jews of Antioch. He says, Behold, ye despisers, and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Because there was Paul declaring it unto them, and they wouldn't believe him. Or fast forward and get to Jesus in 3 Nephi. He says in verse 20, chapter 21, verse 9, For in that day, for my sake, shall the Father work a work which shall be a great and a marvelous work among them. And there shall be among them those who will not believe it, although a man shall declare it unto them. Paul, Jesus, all looking back to Habakkuk, of all people, saying that was a beautiful thing to say. Now, in Paul's and Jesus' case, they were talking restoration. They were talking resurrection. They were talking atonement. They were talking God's ultimate work and glory. And yes, it's too good to be true, but yet, and yet it's still true. In the immediate, that's a higher layer on the layer cake, though. In the immediate context, as far as what Habakkuk was talking about in the short term, it's interesting what he says in the next two verses, six and seven. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, those Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. You could rephrase that. They are a law unto themselves. They do whatever they want. And yet God is going to use them to chasten Judah. He's going to use them to carry them off captive to Babylon, which would just increase the scattering of Israelites across the known world, making the gathering of Israel all the more glorious when people from all nations are brought back with their family, with their friends, gathering all back into the fold. Remember, it was never just about you chosen people. You're meant to choose everyone. So even if I have to scatter you to get you dispersed among them, I've got the long game in mind. Well, but, but to use Babylon to do that? Again, we're back to what we saw with Nahum. Why? You're going to use Assyria to punish us? Assyria deserves to be punished. You're right. And I'll take care of that too. In a similar vein here, what is this, what, this work that you'll wonder marvelously at? What's this thing that you're not going to believe even if you're seeing it or hearing about it? It's the fact that God is going to use Babylon to do his work. And Babylon against Judah is actually for Judah's ultimate good? That doesn't make any sense. Or does it? Will I believe that even though somebody's telling me and a prophet is reassuring this is exactly what God has in mind, it's part of his divine plan, that don't think that God has forsaken or forgotten you just because you're captive off in Babylon. I'll send an Ezekiel to preach, to reassure. I'll send a Daniel. You'll have friends in high places. Later, I'll send an Esther sent to the kingdom for such a time as that. I will be with you even in Babylon. How's that for a marvelous work and a wonder? But yes, there'll be some redemptive turbulence on the way. It will be redemptive, trust me. But it will be turbulent, trust me on that one too. Okay? Believe me, even if you find that unbelievable. Got it? Next he says in verse 8 and 9, Their horses also are swifter than the leopards, and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. Now that's frightening imagery to describe a coming enemy. Leopards, wolves, eagles swooping down upon the prey, and yet that's what the Babylonians will feel like. Will we repent in order to avoid that fate? Or will we succumb to it 
in verse 10 and 11, they shall scoff at the kings and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. Now he just summarized a whole slew of Babylonian history right there. They'll come into town just like the Assyrians did. They will scoff at the kings, scorn the princes, deride the strongholds, just like Rabshakeh, that wicked counselor, did when the Assyrians came. Babylonians, they're going to, in fact, they'll be more successful than the Assyrians were because the Assyrians couldn't conquer Jerusalem. The Babylonians will have no problem. And they'll be able to laugh their way beyond those walls as they force out the people of Israel, deriding every stronghold. But just like the Assyrians before, who then took all the glory to themselves and were punished as a result, the same will happen with the Babylonians. They're imputing that power to their gods instead of honoring the God of Israel. And then Habakkuk asks another question. He started this chapter with one. Well, as we approach its end, he's got another. Verse 12 and 13. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine Holy One? And we shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Which therefore begs this final question. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously? And holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. Now, that passage, 12 and 13, is really key to what we're seeing in Habakkuk. Because it combines some things that Habakkuk knows with some things that Habakkuk doesn't know. Or doesn't quite understand. That's what's leaving him scratching his head. And again, I love his vulnerability. I love his openness. It's the courage of Job. It's the courage and faith of Joseph Smith in liberty. It's... It's wondering how, because of what I know about you, God, why is this happening? And what does he know about God? Notice the phrases. I know you're from everlasting. You're eternal. Well, that should tell you then that I can afford to play the long game. That you can be patient and have faith. Because I'm here for the duration. I'm from everlasting. What else does he know? He knows that we shall not die. That ultimately there is a resurrection, that there is hope. Oh, so I guess I can afford to play the long game too. And even death isn't the end of the story. Huh. So I can trust you even beyond this life. Okay. Along those same lines, the we shall not die is this collective. There's going to be a righteous remnant remaining, isn't there? As long as I hold on to that, then it's not complete annihilation and there'll be someone left to turn to us. Saviors on Mount Zion, gatherers of the scattered. Okay, I can trust in that as well. I can trust in God's judgment. I can trust in his corrective hand. And I can trust in God's pure eyes. I have to hold on to all of that. Those are things I know. And the things I know will always trump the things that I don't know. And what was that specifically? That final question. Why are things happening this way? How can you look upon those that deal treacherously and not rebuke them? Not defeat them when they are acting like our enemies? That's that's the thing we wrestle with. Why do the wicked sometimes prosper and the righteous sometimes suffer? Well, we have to keep those question marks in the context of all the exclamation points that surround it. So I love the way Habakkuk asked that question. It's in the midst of all of these exclamations. I know what I know, and that should get me through the things that I don't yet know. Then verse 14 and 15, an interesting role reversal hinted at in this passage. It begins, and makest men as the fishes of the sea. Well, who? Who does that? Who makest men? And if you go back to the previous verse, it's these wicked people that are devouring people that are more righteous than they are. Why are the wicked prospering at the, righteous, at the expense of the righteous? And here's this description of it. They're making men as the fish of the sea, as the creeping things. They have no ruler over them. 
They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net. They gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Now, that's a confusing verse until we realize that fishermen is the focal point here. When he talks about taking them up with the angle, remember fishermen are also called anglers. They've baited the hook or they've cast out the net. They're dragging their catch back to shore. And when, and as he describes the Babylonians in these terms, that they're going to gather you up in their wicked way, not the gathering of Israel in the righteous way. They are going to, they'll be the men and you'll be the fish. You'll be the creeping thing and they'll crush you. In, in a way, this is a reversal of the creation. Because remember in the creation account, man and woman, Adam and Eve, were given dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowls of the air and every, every creeping thing. They were rulers over them. And Adam and Eve themselves had no rulers over them. Well, no ruler but God, that is. Well, these Babylonians won't be ruled by God. They have no ruler then. And they're treating the, the Israelites, the people of Judah, like mere fish or creeping things. Even when it says that makest men as the fishes of the sea, the word there in Hebrew is Adam, Adam. They're making Adam into a fish. They're taking people that are supposed to act and they're forcing them to be acted upon. They're taking away their God-given agency. And now they're just fish unable to escape the net. Creeping things that can't creep away fast enough from their enemies. Interesting what the wicked world is trying to do, turning agents into objects, Sac forcing us to sacrifice our agency, addictive sin. Oh, there's so much of this in the world. And once we're caught in the world's net and dragged back to shore, what does the wicked world then say? What do the Babylonians believe? Verse 16 and 17. Therefore they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? Just like Isaiah said of the Assyrians and of the Babylonians, here we see it again, they're going to take credit to themselves. All of it. They, like Isaiah said, they will say, by the strength of my hand have I done this. How did you conquer Israel? Well, truth would say, well, the God of Israel simply used me as a form of chastisement of his people. But what will the Babylonians say and said? No, it was our net, and so let us honor our mighty net. It was our drag, and so let us burn incense to our drag. Talk about looking for false gods anywhere you can find them, when the true God of Israel is just above you all along. Turn, look up, turn to him, and even you Babylonians have a chance to change. They just won't take it. So Habakkuk 2 comes, and with it, an amazing message of patience and faith for the Israelites. Because yes, you're on the receiving end of all this Babylonian destruction, but the day will come where Babylon itself is destroyed, and that will spell deliverance to you because your captors are taken captive. Once there's that role reversal, the fish will no longer be caught in the net. You'll be Adam again, a man whose only ruler is the Lord. So he says in chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Or another way to put that, and how he will answer my complaint. How is God going to respond to all these questions that I'm asking him? That's a beautiful role of a prophet as well. We call them watchmen on the tower, and you get that same idea here. I'll stand on my watch. I'll be set on my tower. But it's not just that I'm watching for the enemy coming from below. I'm also looking for the word coming from above. They are closer to the Lord in that way, to receive institutional revelation, counsel for the collective. And that's one thing Joseph was at, waiting for in Liberty Jail. One thing that Job was seeking, a direct response from God, to see, this, this is Wilfred Woodruff in 1890. What do we do about all this, this persecution? What do we do about plural marriage? This was 1978 with Spencer W. Kimball. Is it time yet? We've been waiting and hoping and praying for this. 
for a long, long time? Can the priesthood and the blessings of the temple be extended to all of thy children? Yeah, of course there are yet revelations to come. And thankfully we have watchmen on the tower watching to see what God will say to them, including how he will answer their questions. So I'm sure they have plenty they are asking. In verse 2 and 3, Habakkuk says, The Lord answered me. So be patient. He's worth the wait. He's been, he asked all through chapter 1. He's finally getting an answer. And the Lord said to him, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables or upon tablets, that he may run that readeth it. Which could either mean, write it down so a herald can run with the message and bring it to other people. Or that might mean, write it down so big that even someone like racing by can read it. That's why they print the, the text really big on billboards as you're flying past them on the freeway. Okay? So write it down and write it big so all the world can know. And here it is. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Just because judgment and justice seem to be slow in coming does not mean they'll never come. I may be slow to anger, but I will come down in judgment and justice upon your enemies. In the meantime, I'm trying to give them a chance to repent. And I'm trying to give you a chance to prepare. I'm trying to be with them and call them to repentance. I'm trying to be with you and calm your troubled hearts. I care about all my children after all. So be patient with me. It might be slow in coming. Just wait for it. That's what my father-in-law said to me about my wife when I was in the middle of months and months of proposing. He simply said, be patient. She's worth the wait. And she always has been. To see the Lord far, even more, far above that, I'll be worth the wait. Just trust me. Elder Maxwell once said that part of saying thy will be done to the Lord is also saying thy timing be done. And that might be the hardest part. I know God will come through. I just wish he'd do it a little sooner. I, I want the blessing now, or this promise in my patriarchal blessing is, can we speed this up? Can I get this now instead of later? It reminds me actually of something Peter said about the second coming. As there was so much hope that Christ would return quickly, and that was 2,000 years ago. We're still waiting. He's still tarrying. But though it be long, it will surely come. Peter knew that. And so he says this in 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This goes back to what we saw earlier about God striking this precarious balance between hastening his work, shortening the day, and prolonging our time so that we can repent. It makes it easier on one group, but harder on the other, and vice versa. And so here he is in his perfect wisdom trying to balance things perfectly. Just don't call him a slacker because it's taking longer than you want. Please know that he's working on a whole lot of people. And sometimes the delay in route for you is a chance for someone else to change. Just trust that he'll come. So what's the counsel that Habakkuk gives in verse 4? One of the most important verses anywhere in Scripture. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. So if it's pride that's pushing you on this, if it's pride that's forcing you to be impatient, if you're accusing God of never coming through and, and he's not worth the wait, then how should you respond instead? The second half of verse 4. But the just shall live by his faith. And the Hebrew word there would be more accurately translated by his faithfulness. His steadfastness. The Hebrew word means something like firmness and fidelity. In fact, back in Exodus 17, when Moses is supposed to raise his hands as the Israelites are fighting the Amalekites down in the valley below. Remember this story? 
and his hands are heavy because a battle takes a long time. And so Aaron and Hur lift up the hands. And at the end of the story, when it says that Moses' hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and th thus they won the, not won the battle, that word for steady is the word used here for faith. It's faithful. It's steadfast. It stays strong no matter how heavy things come with the, become with the passage of time. If it was just, hey, raise your hand and, and then we win, that's, that's easy, but it doesn't, doesn't say much about us. No, it's holding our hands up the whole time. It's trusting that God is not slack concerning his promises, that he'll come through for us if we can just hold our hands steady, if we can remain steadfast, if we can be faithful, which also means being full of faith. What's so powerful about that passage is that it's one that Paul focuses on. Paul loved his Habakkuk, evidently. He quoted the previous passage about, it's still good, you're not even going to believe it. And in, to the Roman saints, he quotes this one. He says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. See, he just quoted Habakkuk too. To the Galatians, he quotes the same verse in Galatians 3.11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for, and here he quotes it, the just shall live by faith. And then later in the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 36 through 38, we read this. For ye have need of patience. Ah, patience was what Habakkuk was suggesting all along. That after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while. So wait for it, wait for it. Though it tarry, just stay strong. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Can you see why Paul would love that passage so much? To quote it and quote it and quote it again. Because Paul was waiting for the second coming. Paul was wrestling with doubters and skeptics and impatient saints not willing to wait upon the Lord. And so what did he keep on saying? The just shall live by faith. It was that promise in the Romans version, in the Romans quote of Habakkuk, that a monk concerned about his own salvation had an epiphany that changed the history of the world. When Martin Luther read Romans 1 and heard Habakkuk's voice echoing across the ages, that's how we make it. We don't make it on our righteousness alone. I mean, obviously God wants us to live faithfully. That's the Hebrew term. But he also wants us to live in faith in him. That he's not slack concerning the promises. He's going to come through for me. And if I can trust in his righteousness, when my righteousness falls short, then I can afford to be patient even with myself, along with everyone else around me. I can afford to be patient with God. I can, be, I can afford to be patient with the process. I can afford to be patient with loved ones that are struggling in their righteousness or in their own faith. Because the just shall live by faith and faithfulness. And we can trust in a God that's worth the wait. That was the game changer for Martin Luther. He, in my opinion, overswung the pendulum, like we typically all do, and took it to the extreme of faith, or at least many of his followers, took it to the extreme of faith in faith alone, as opposed to faith and faithfulness together. And some are, sadly, imagining false things about a God who thinks, oh yeah, go ahead and take your hands down. They don't need to be firm as long as you believe in me and pay me some lip service. No, that's, that's not what 
Martin Luther intended. It's certainly not what Paul intended. It's certainly not what Habakkuk intended. And, but for us to just see that passage in context, I, I love it the way Paul gives it to us in each of those three settings. But I, I love Habakkuk's probably best of all. Because here's a prophet who's wrestling with his own impatience, his own lack of understanding. Why aren't things going better when we're trying our very best? God, where art thou in all of this? What saw Job through his sufferings? His faith and his faithfulness. Though I die, I will trust in him. Right? Though I die, I will not remove my integrity from him, from me. No. And, how, and what got Joseph Smith through Liberty Jail? He knew God. And he had faith in him and remained faithful to him. He lived by faith. And that carries him and carries us through anything we face. Thank you, Habakkuk, for that. Verse 5, he then adds, Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, which suggests he's never at rest. Proud, he's always looking for things. Wine, he's, he's try, stumbling around in transgression. Who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Great analogy, Habakkuk. See, death and hell are never satisfied, and neither is Babylon. Death gobbles up everyone who ever lives. So does sin. No wonder Jacob described this two-headed monster as sin and death, or as death and hell. And here Habakkuk is seeing or portraying Babylon as that same two-headed monster. And it is enlarging its desire. That's how much Babylon wants. And again, it's back to that passage I mentioned earlier from Revelation 18, that it's ultimately after the slaves and souls of men. It wants to gobble you up, and Babylon has an insatiable appetite. He's never satisfied. But that's not the end of the story. In verse 6 and 7, Shall not all these take up a parable against him, and a taunting proverb against him? In other words, people are going to mock and ridicule the king of Babylon, which is exactly what happens in Isaiah 14. And what Habakkuk is going to give us from here on out is five taunts. Okay, five woes. That's how you can spot them. It'll be a woe. The first one, he says, they'll say, woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. See, the, this insatiable appetite, just gobbling up anything in its wake, wanting to take over the whole world. That's the Babylonian Empire. But woe to him. How long, Habakkuk asks, to him that ladeth himself with thick clay, and the thick clay there are like clay tablets where you're writing down you know, like receipts for business, transactions, and so on. So they're laden with thick clay, loaded with pledges, with loans. This is either you're rich because you're going into debt, and here's all these IOUs I owe people, or you're rich because those are IOUs that other people owe you. You're extorting money out of others. Either way, this is capitalism run amok. And they're laden with thick clay, trying to increase things that don't really belong to them. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee, and awake that shall vex thee? And thou shalt be for booties unto them? You see, your creditors will suddenly arise and call you to settle the accounts. And if you're unable to do it, oh, all I have are these, these notes, these IOUs, these, these thick clay tablets. All I have now is worthless paper and broken promises. My wealth went up in smoke. And now I am the booty. I'm the prey to my creditors. In verse 8 and 9, Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee. How's that for reaping what you sow? How's that for enforced empathy? Because of men's blood and for the violence of the land, of the city, of all that dwell therein. Woe, here's the second one, woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house. 
that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Did you really think your wealth and power would save you in the day of reckoning? <laughs> Just because your nest was high enough, you thought you could escape those scavengers or those predators that were prowling down below? I mean, earlier we saw the leopards and we saw the wolves, right? But what else did we see? Ah, yes, the eagles swooping down from above. Yeah, I don't think your nest is quite as safe as you think it is. Do we really think we can buy our way out of the consequences of our sins? In verse 10 through 12, he says, Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and hast sinned against thy soul. So you brought this evil upon yourself, sinning against your own soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall, the beam out of the timber shall answer it, Woe! And here's the third one. To him that buildeth a town with blood, and establisheth a city by iniquity. Think about that in terms of what our society is built upon. The way Habakkuk is giving it here to the Babylonians, your town is built with blood. Its foundation is iniquity. But what's, what's the building itself going to do? It's going to cry out against you. It will stand as witness, number one, for the prosecution. So it's amazing when it talks about stones crying out of the wall, beams out of the timber. I mean, to address society itself, the, the societal structures that we inhabit and occupy, and ask it, Oh, so what do you think about things? How, how do you think we're doing? And to have the stones and the timbers themselves say, do you have any idea what we're made of? We were built on the backs of oppression of the poor and the needy, dishonesty, uh, greed, corruption, violence, you name it. That's how we got ahead. That's how we built this superstructure. Oh, be careful because that superstructure itself will testify against us as it begins to collapse all around us. Talk about the plumb line that Amos saw. Are we measuring up? Because if not, those tilted timbers will let us know. When we see the untempered mortar that Ezekiel talked about, and the stones starting to shift under the weight of all this glory we keep heaping up as we build our own Tower of Babel, trying to reach heaven in our own way. How's that for a high nest, right? Oh no, those stones will crumble. Those beams will topple. It'll all come crashing down. Verse 13 and 14. Keep looking for more woes. There's two more coming. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire. The New International Version renders that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire. It's going to all go up in smoke. Everything they've been working for. The people shall weary themselves for very vanity. Why do we work so hard for things that do not matter? For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Just like Isaiah prophesied. That was his words back in Isaiah 11 when he talked about millennial peace. And where does the water not cover the sea? Uh, the sea is water all the way down. <laughs> exactly. And the millennial reign, it will be the knowledge of God all the way down, all the way through. Everyone will know him. And once we do, talk about buyer's remorse. Why did I spend so much of my time and attention and talent on things that don't matter at all. When I could have been building the kingdom, when I could have been serving my fellow man or woman, when I could have been coming closer and closer to Christ. But now, I've wearied myself for very vanity. And all that I labored to acquire has gone up in smoke. No wonder he says in verse 15 and 16, woe. Here's woe number four. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also. Well, I guess misery loves company. Uh, you don't want to drink alone. That thou mayest look on their nakedness. Ooh, but that's what you were doing that for? You were tricking people into making fools of themselves? 
In some ways, this is like the conspiring men that Doctrine and Covenants 89 talks about that are trying to convince others to fleece themselves. That's this idea of let me get you drunk so I can look upon your nakedness. Let me intoxicate you with all of these incredible things that you can buy. And to get them all, yeah, you'll end up fleecing yourself. You'll end up selling your soul and you'll have nothing to show for it. He goes on, thou art filled with shame for glory. Or we could say, you have shame instead of glory. You were seeking glory. That's not what you ended up with. You had shame instead. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. There's a repetition of the drunkenness and nakedness he said in the previous verse. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. How's that for a taste of your own medicine, a drink of your own wine? You'll be the one that ends up naked, exposed, even as you've been trying to strip everyone else of everything that they have. You're the one that's been trying to intoxicate them. Well, you'll be the one suffering with one heck of a hangover as you are spewing out the things that you consumed the night before. I mean, this is a graphic image. But boy, does it seem fitting. He says in 17, for the violence of Lebanon, or in other words, the violence you did to Lebanon, cutting down its cedars to enrich yourself. Oh, that those cedars shall cover thee. You'll be crushed by the trees you've been cutting down. And the spoil of beasts, which made them afraid because of men's blood and for the violence of the land, of the city, of all that dwell therein. That phrase of the spoil of beasts, which made them afraid, I get a sense there that your feelings will shift from that of predator to that of prey. Whenever I watch those nature movies or, or documentaries and it shows a predator bearing down upon the prey, man, I get scared to death for the prey every time. I'm, I'm always on the prey's side. <laughs> even though the predator, I guess, has to eat too, but not eat like this. And those who have been rapacious and, and, and with an insatiable appetite, trying to gobble up anyone else around them in order to get ahead, the day will come where you know what it feels like. A more enforced empathy yet again, as you become the prey to someone else's violence. Babylon, enjoy your time on the top because Persia is closer than you realize. And all, again, I, that's why I love this metaphor of the cedars of Lebanon. Those that you're cutting down to be able to build your pleasant palaces. I don't know if anybody yelled timber in time because it came down and crushed you. Powerful, powerful images here. A few more. He says in verse 18 and 19, what profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it? The molten image and a teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols. What profit can they possibly give you? You made them. They can't make you. Woe, he says. This is his fifth and final one. Again, these taunts that people will raise against a fallen Babylon. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake! And to the dumb stone, arise, it shall teach. Can you picture him just making fun of this, ridiculing their idolatry? Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, but there is no breath at all in the midst of it. He really is reducing this to the absurd because it is absurd that we would think that some graven image can turn around and do any, do any good to us. Yes, it looks good on the outside, but all that glitters is not gold. And underneath that golden facade is a dumb stone that can say nothing to you when you ask it for direction. Beware those things, I think he's suggesting, that have no breath. Catch the last phrase. There is no breath at all. Because remember, breath in Hebrew is the same word for wind. It's the same word for spirit. So beware of those things that will take and take and take and never give. And those things that we seem to, to speak to it lovingly 
all the time, and yet it can give us nothing back by way of direction. It has no voice, it has no breath, it has no spirit. On the other hand, verse 20, beautiful way to end this chapter, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. As opposed to silent stones and dumb idols, we have a God who is willing to speak out of his holy house. Where does that leave us? All ears. <laughs> May we keep silence before him, knowing he is in his holy temple. Knock on, a, on an idol's door, and you'll realize there's no one home but call to God in the temple and prepare yourself for a message from a God who loves you. He's home, <laughs> after all. Chapter 3 then gives us one last chance to remember who this God is at home in his holy temple. And to do so, Habakkuk reminds them of the past to help them navigate the present. It's a great way to do it. In verse 1 and 2, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon Shigeyonoth, which is some type of poetry or song most likely. He says or sings, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. Not afraid in the bad way, awe-inspired in a good way. The New International Version renders that. I have heard of your fame and stand in awe of your deeds. Ah, there's hearing the speech. That's being awestruck. The text then goes on, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In other words, repeat them in our day. Revive all the things you did in the past, in the midst of those years. Do them in the midst of these, all these incredible miracles you performed. He says, in the midst of the years, make known in wrath, which is what we're facing from Babylon. Remember mercy. And that's such a beautiful prayer to offer. When you are suffering, when you're struggling, when you're up against the world and feel that it's coming crashing down upon you, pray to God that in wrath he will remember mercy. Just like he did in the Exodus, just like he has done so many times throughout Israel's history when the pride cycle had brought them down to the depths and they deserved to be destroyed. But when they humbly turned back to the Lord, he turned back to them. And despite wrath all around, he remembered mercy. That's the prayer of Habakkuk. And again, it's this sense of, I know what you've done in the past. Please do it again. He reviews some of those mighty works in the next few verses. Three through six, God came from Timan and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand. And that's a bad translation. These horns are rays of light. Rays of light coming from his hand. There was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. See how he's summing it up with the end, that last statement? If his ways are everlasting, then he hasn't changed. And the kind of God he's been in the past is the kind of God he'll be in the present and off into the future. This was the God of the Exodus. This was a God who, whose glory covered the heavens, who through the pestilence and the plague was able to deliver us from our bondage. That light shining through darkness, a cloud of smoke, a pillar of fire, burning coals. How's that for Isaiah's experience, being purified by, by God? Review the Old Testament. Here we are approaching its end. And see a God who has been powerful, who has been merciful, who has been a deliverer and a redeemer and a savior because that's what he came to earth to do. And once you realize who he was and couple it with the fact that his ways are everlasting, then you know who he is and who he will forever be. That you can completely trust in that. 
Though it tarry, wait for it. He'll come through. I actually remember one year in seminary, the first year I ever taught New Testament, we were studying the miracles of Jesus and saying to the man in, in the, lying on this bed, unable to walk, son, be of good cheer. Thy sins are forgiven thee. And then the second breath, take up thy bed and walk. And there were so many miracles of healing that we studied in class that it wasn't till the end of class, it dawned on me that two of my students that semester might be thinking about those miracles in a different way. Because Cindy had spent her life in a wheelchair and Brandon had too. And I loved Cindy and I loved Brandon. They were such good celestial souls. But my heart went out to them as I thought of their perspective on these miracles of physical healing. And I wondered if they wished they'd been living in New Testament times. I wondered if there was a sense like you did that, you were, you were that kind of God. Why aren't you that kind of God? Why are miracles in the past tense instead of the present? And two things struck me. One was to that man lying in the bed, lower down through the roof tiles, two statements from the Lord. One was physical healing, which is why he came, but one was spiritual healing. And if you could only pick one of those two, which would it be? I'll stay in this bed the rest of my life if I can just be spiritually clean, because then I can return home. And I thought of Cindy and Brandon and thought, that miracle is still as available today as it ever was. And if you could only pick one, you can be clean. And those two were. The other thought that crossed my mind is, why isn't the present tense God like the past tense one? And the thought came thundering in, he is. His ways are everlasting, Habakkuk reminds us. And we still live in a day of miracles. And if we don't, then where is our faith? Mormon would ask. It has to be his time. It has to be his way. It has to be his will. And we might have to tarry. But in the meantime, the just shall live by faith and faithfulness. So keep the hands steady and tarry. Because the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Bank on that to every Cindy, to every Brandon, to every one of us. His ways are everlasting. Now, not only is God the God of the Exodus, though, he's also the God of the elements, and it's all under his control. So Habakkuk says in verse 7 through 9, I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea, that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. This is the same king of creation that Nahum mentioned about rebuking the sea and drying up rivers. Red Sea, Jordan, he's done it all. In verse 10 and 11, the mountains saw thee and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went and at the shining of thy glittering spear. This is the same God that caused the sun to stand still so Joshua could continue and ultimately win his battle. And God will lengthen our days so we can win whatever wars we need to. We just have to believe that his ways are everlasting. And it's the same God now as it was then. In verse 12 and 13, Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. Salah. That's a harder one to understand. But if God is marching through the land in indignation, if he's threshing the heathen in his anger, we've gone from Exodus through the wilderness wanderings, crossing the Red Sea, crossing the Jordan River, right? All these miracles all along the way. For what? To enter a promised land that was occupied. 
and yet that the Lord in his indignation would march through, thresh the heathen to clear out space for the chosen people to dwell. That's the promise there. This is the salvation he's offered to his anointed, his chosen, each of whom is meant to be anointed to go out and anoint everyone else, to be a savior on Mount Zion, to be a mini Messiah, bringing the fullness of the gospel to all of God's children around the world. He says in 14 and 15, thou didst strike through with his staves, the head of his villages. You can rephrase that. You took the enemy's own weapons and turned them back on them. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly, but God wouldn't let them. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great waters. God, throughout Israel's history, led Israel's armies and conquered, defeated, vanquished Israel's enemies. Even with Babylon bearing down on you, trust that he'll do the same. Then, having recalled all that God had done in the past, Habakkuk's faith is renewed for the present. He stands in awe of the God of Israel. He says in verse 16, When I heard my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones. I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. You get a sense there at how overwhelmed Habakkuk is with all that still lies ahead. His, his knees knocking, his trembling within himself. This is a day of trouble and yet God can offer me rest? That's all he's seeking. For the Lord to come and fight Israel's battles, he will, if we'll have him. If you remember the great line in, we thank thee, O God, for a prophet, we have proved him in days that are past. And the wicked who fight against Zion, Babylon personified, shall surely be smitten at last. That day has come as far as Habakkuk is concerned. So he says in verse 17 and 18, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold and there shall be no herd in the stalls. How's that for utter devastation? There's nothing left. Yet, Habakkuk declares, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. No matter what current conditions look like, I will trust in the Lord. <laughs> For he is good. And because he is good, it's all good. I worry sometimes that we're in, when we're in the midst of something difficult, like Habakkuk just described, and there's no fig trees and there's no blossoms and no vines, and it seems like there's no hope. And we pray for something and we just feel that overwhelming spirit of comfort and peace and reassurance. And sometimes we mistake that to mean this one thing that I'm asking for right now in this moment is about to happen. You know what I mean by that? We feel the reassuring spirit of God and it's like, this is going to work. What I'm asking for is going to come. And sometimes that's the case, but sometimes it's not that the Lord is saying, this is going to be good. Rather, it's all good because I'm good. I'm aware of where you are. I know your circumstance. I play the long game. My ways are everlasting. I'll be here for you. And though it tarry, wait for it. Because I have... I have your own salvation at heart. And sometimes patience and faith is what I'm trying to develop in you, not just an early escape. To me, there's something profound about the way Habakkuk is finishing his little book. Rejoicing in the Lord. How did he start? God, what is going on? I don't understand this. How long will we have to go through? Are you not seeing this? He's wrestling with his faith until he realizes, wait a minute, that's the key to all of this. 
not just getting out of the situation, because by the end, as he's describing these final verses, the situation has not improved. In some ways, maybe it's worse with nothing blossoming and no, no blessings as far as the eye can see. And yet, with spiritual eyes, I can see those blessings. They're far off, but I know they're on their way. And, and the just shall live by faith. Hmm. Faith in a God of the past that's no different as God of the present. No wonder I can yet rejoice in the Lord. Because what do I know about him? Verse 19, Habakkuk's final words. The Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hinds feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. <laughs> Go sing that. Go put that in your hymn book and sing it. Sing it out in terms of praise, in terms of gratitude, in terms of a declaration of my faith in the Lord. Because he's my strength. <laughs> and I will sing every step I take as I walk up upon those high places. If the Lord is at home in his holy house and it's the mountain of the Lord, then that's where I'll climb. And no matter how steep the path, no matter how precarious the journey, he will make my feet like Heinz feet. Mike Wilcox, affectionately known to me as Uncle Mike, recently wrote a beautiful little book called Holding On. And in it, he talks about navigating faith crisis and just holding on to the things you know, even when blessings seem to be far off in the distance. And one of my favorite principles he points out is from this verse in Habakkuk about hinds feet. The concept is mentioned elsewhere in scripture. Uh, often earlier we saw talk about feet not sliding. Well, if a hind in this case is like a deer or a mountain goat or some kind of ibex, their feet are made in such a way, created by the creator himself in such a way that they can just grip rock where there doesn't seem to be even a toehold. It's, have you ever seen those nature documentaries? It's crazy as they're just climbing up sheer cliffs. But their feet don't slide. As we live in a world of wickedness, as we're surrounded by Babylon, trying to rob us of everything we have, including the faith that we're meant to live by, you and I all know people around us whose feet have slipped. To the point that sometimes we start getting nervous, like, are any of these footholds, will any, will any foothold hold? And what we need is more faith in the Lord, trusting in Him, Him being the source of our strength to the point that our feet suddenly morph into Heinz feet that can grip the tiniest crevice and keep ascending the mountain of the Lord. That's to me what being unshaken really looks like but it always comes as a blessing from God, the God who is our strength, if we'll simply live by faith in him.